officially by clicking this here button. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that we're now streaming. Okay. Yeah, it seems like we are. All, All right. right. Welcome. Um, so again, you, you should be familiar with the format now. Uh, we're going to alternate the questions uh, and kind of provide constructive feedback on the, the answers. Um, this is not a lecture or tutorial. This is more like what you would do in an exam. So we're going to take off, we're going to try and take off our, our teacher hats and, uh, and do what you should do in an exam. Okay. So I start with the first question. Is that it? Yep. Okay, let me just put down my coffee and grab a pen. Okay, so the first question um, asks, asks us to determine conditions on B1, B2, B3, B4 such that this vector here with the Bs as entries is in the span of these three vectors, these three vectors with four entries each. So um, I guess we need to think about what the span is. Um, also maybe let me, let me denote this vector by B just so Quite a bit of a shorter notation there. So, what have we got? B is in the span of, okay, I guess I don't need to copy them down again. And so, when is this the case? So, when is a vector in the span? Well, that's the case if B is equal to the first vector times some lambda 1 plus the second vector times some lambda 2 plus the third vector times some lambda 3. So that's just the definition of the span. So B is in the span if this equation holds for some lambdas. Lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3 in R. So what we need to do now is we need to go and solve this system and see if we can get a, so get a solution. And if we get a solution then that, that means there are these lambdas and that will mean that this thing is in this, that, that B is in that span and if we don't get a solution then it means that B isn't in the span. Okay, so let's write this system as an augmented matrix and go ahead and solve it. So here's my system. One, two, four, one. 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 2, 1, negative 3, and negative 7. And on the right-hand side, B1, B2, B3, and B4. So this is the system. And now we want to determine when the system has a solution. So let's go, go ahead and solve it. Let's do some Gaussian elimination. So the first line I keep. Okay. Now in the second line, I want to turn this entry here into a zero. So I'm going to do row two is going to be row two minus two row one. And that will produce a zero right here. And then this will be one, five, and B1 minus two. Sorry, that's a, a B2 minus two B1. So that's just that row here. And then I'm just going to keep going in this, whole, in, in this matrix so that I don't have to write too much stuff. So now we want to turn this entry here into a zero. So row three is going to be row three minus four times row one. That will produce a zero here. Um, negative three plus eight is five. And this will be B3 minus four B1. And then for the last row, we want to produce a zero there. So we just subtract the first row from it. So row 4 is going to be row 4 minus row 1. So hopefully I'm not making, many, making any mistakes here. Um, Daniel, you're watching me? So far, so good. Okay. So 0, that's a negative 1. Negative 7 minus negative 2 is negative 5. And so here we're going to have B4 minus B1. Okay. So that's the first step, um, producing zeros below that one here. So let's keep going now. So it's the next thing that we do. It's going to be, well, that first row is good. The second row is, is good. 1, 0, negative 2, B1. 0, 1, 5, B2, minus 2, B1. 
Now here I'm going to subtract the second row from the third row to get to, to turn this entry here into a zero. So row three is going to be row three minus row two. So that will be all zeros in fact. And here I'm going to have, so on the right hand side, going to have B3 minus B2 and then negative 4B1 plus 2B1, so that's minus 2B1. So that's the third row right there. I'm probably, my, my face is probably not in the picture, is it? Um, there we go. And now let's also look at the last row. So here I'm going to add row 2 and row 4 in order to get rid of this entry there. So row 4 is going to be row 2 plus row 4 and I will get 0, 0, 0, B4 plus B2 um, minus 3B1. That's still looking alright Daniel? He's nodding. Okay. You guys can't see him but I can see him. Okay. So now we've gone ahead and we've, um, we've solved this system in the sense that we've um, produced a, a row echelon form on the left side here. And now what we want to know is when this system has a solution. So we want to come up with some conditions on the Bs um, for when this system has a solution. And so that's the case. So we've got two zero rows on the left hand side here. And now we, the system has a solution if we don't get any contradictions there. So that's the case if these two entries on the right here are zero then I'm just, I've just got zero rows and that's okay, I can go, I've got a solution to this system. And otherwise, if I've got something non-zero here, then that's a contradiction in, in that row and I don't get a solution. So from this we see that, so the, the system has a solution if, so B3 minus B2 minus 2B1, isn't zero and B B four plus B two minus three B one. Uh, sorry, it is zero. Is zero. So I mixed that up. So it has a solution if if these two entries are zero, and otherwise it doesn't. And now I'm out of space, but. Um, maybe I can just say it. Can I write another line there? Yeah. Um, so the, the original question was determine conditions um, on the Bs such that the B is in the span. Well, it's in the span if and only if this system has, has a solution. So that means in this case here, it is in the span. I don't, I don't think you need yeah. to write anything okay. on that. Okay, that's all right. Um, so yeah, there we go. As, as, as someone, can I put on my marking hat and get a red pen? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> So, so <laughs> this is the, 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 the hour of truth now, is it? Um, no, it's, it's, it's easy for me to come along and see that this is, uh, this is the right answer. I mean, you'd be looking for some kind of conditions on this, on, on the B. So even if I was just to glance at this for a second, I'd see that there's conditions on the Bs. I know this is, this is looking good. You don't need to simplify this anymore, by the way. Just this, this is perfect. Um, row operations, there we are. Um, I, I tend to do one row operation at a time because I, I, I make less mistakes that way. Um, you're obviously professional at this. Well, <laughs> also, I, I've, I've got limited board space, right? Have, yeah. I mean, if I had a big piece of paper yeah. in front of me, maybe I would have I done the same as what you just said. So um, maybe something you might like to do is just use more space. I would recommend one row operation at a time. At least that's what, that's what I do myself. Um, but look, it, it's, it's, it's perfect. I've got nothing to say. Okay, cool. In that it's case, I think it's your turn. turn All right. It? Then we get out of the... Ah, we have to wipe the board. Yeah. Let's wipe the board. I can do this. Oh, I can, I can, I can do that. All right, top. I feel like I'm cleaning the windows at my house. <laughs> I do have... There's one of these things. You can... Oh, we've got actual <laughs> we, window cleaning yes, stuff. We could actually clean this as, as if it was a window, but that's. I you think know, it's looking pretty good though. Right? Oh, look, no, there we are. Oh. Got something. Oh. There we are. Okay, well. um, one of the comments in the chat was about, uh, was asking, what test are we doing? We're doing a selection of problems from 
the tests as well as from the tutorial problems as well. So I know in previous streams we've actually just picked a test and done questions from that test. This time we're doing it a little bit differently and picking a variety of different um, questions. Right. <sighs> My turn. Uh, use the identity, this identity, to write cos to the power 5 theta in terms of cosines of multiples of theta. So cos theta, cos 2 theta, cos 3 theta, and so on. All right. Well, this is this would be a typical kind of two mark question. We're given what we need to do, and really we just need to raise this to the power, raise this to the power five, and uh, and turn the handle. So since we're given that, then I can just raise everything to the power five. So I have to use uh, I have to use the expansion of this thing raised to the power five, and perhaps you uh, don't remember your coefficients, or maybe you do. In either case, you can quickly draw the Pascal's triangle and figure out what the coefficients are. So I'll just do that quickly over here. Good. So a, a little a little kind of aside just to remember just to help you remember what the coefficients are so the one plus five to the four e to the to negative plus ten plus another ten e to the i theta But it's just the binomial expansion of this. And now, now I'm going to do something uh, pretty fancy, which is take these powers inside here. Now, there's a theorem that tells you can, you can do that. This, this on its own is just an abbreviation for cos theta plus i sine theta. And the fact that you can take the 5 in and multiply, take the fifth power of this by multiplying the theta by 5 is called de Moivre's theorem. This one's uh, e to the four theta minus e to the I, e to the four i theta minus e to the i theta, which I'll just write as e to the i three theta. This one's three theta minus two theta, which is one theta. This one here is two theta minus three minus three theta, which is negative three theta, and negative i theta. This one. 1 theta minus 4 theta is negative 3 theta. And this one's e to the negative i 5 theta. OK. Now I'll pair up my, I have to get this back into terms of causes and signs. And again, I'll use this identity, but with cos 5 theta, 3 theta, and regular theta. So I'll just pair these up. This will be e to the i 5 theta plus this one. And then I'll do the 3 thetas. And then the 10, th oh, and there's 5 of them. And then 10 of these ones. Like that. And actually, what I really want is half of these things. So I'll bring in 
I'll make that a 16 and I'll write that as over 2, that is over 2, and that is over 2. Now I literally have cos 5 theta plus 5, sine, uh, 5 cos 3 theta plus 10 cos theta. Good. And uh, maybe, maybe I'm not confident about this, but a, a quick thing you could do to check is just substitute in what happens when theta is equal to zero. When theta is equal to zero, this should be one. It's just well, one to the raised to the power five, which is still one. And this is one sixteenth of one plus five plus 10. So one sixteenth of 16, again, it's equal to one. So just, just check quickly. Just check quickly that you've got the right numbers here by substituting something sensible in like theta equals zero. Good. Uh, yeah, that's uh, well done. I was going to suggest exactly the same thing, so there <laughs> awesome. you go. Um, I was doing this problem before and I did forget about the one half and I figured it out exactly in this way. Um, so yeah, I guess one thing is don't forget the one half. Mm. That's a, sort of a common yeah. thing that and, could happen. And if you get sine, I should mention, we should also mention that there's an i here. When you, when you do this with a sine, it's actually e to the i theta minus e to the i negative theta divided by 2i. So don't forget the don't forget the 2 or the 2i. Yeah, oh, that's right. Um, the other thing, uh, we've had this uh, conversation before. I don't really, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the point of doing something like this? You explained it to me before. Maybe oh. you can say it for the benefit of everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't really like these problems, or I didn't before you said to me. Um, you, might, you might get asked to take an integral of a power of uh, cosine or sine, for example. And by converting cos to the power theta into cosines or sines of multiples of theta, then that enables you to actually integrate this thing. Um, so it's it's a kind of it's something you might actually do. So it's not just something we it's it's largely something we just taught you with to make sure you've been paying attention in class. But it also might actually be useful in some some sense. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for telling me about that as well. <laughs> yeah. I have nothing else to say. Let's let's yes, keep going. Huh? All right. What about stating Demoivre's theorem? Do you think that's a do you think that's a necessary step? Stating it, stating it when you write down the yeah. As in, like saying that you're using it or stating the actual theorem. No, saying that you're using it. Huh. Well, look, if I was marking this, then I'd like to see that the student knows what they're doing, and I'd be very happy to see that. Um, I don't know. It depends yeah. on the marker. I mean, I. That was I like to be very precise and just actually use down, write down the things I'm using, but mm. I guess it depends on... That's yeah. a question of taste, isn't for, it? Well, for a two-mark question, you, you probably wouldn't say... You probably wouldn't say someone must cite the theorem they're using. For a, if it was a five-mark question, <laughs> then, then, you, then you, yeah, you, you'd have to come up with some kind of criteria to, to, to judge people. So you could easily kind of make that a four-mark question if you wanted to. But I, sure. I, my feeling is that would be a two-mark question. In any case, if you see Demoivre's theorem, say Demoivre's theorem. <laughs> it's a yeah. safe. It's it shows up. You know what, yeah, it shows Never up. Never a bad idea to say what you're doing. Yeah. All right. Um, um, okay. Next, next what, what do we do next? Let's uh, let's just grab this one. Yep. That means you're up again. I'm, I'm up again. Yeah, that's cool. Well, let's do this one then, because then we can all keep alternating. Well. Is we? No. Right, I, I, right, I think the way this. we've written them up. All right, doesn't matter. It's I'll not going to happen. Right, that's again. okay. Sweet. Yeah, you again. You go for it. Okay, I get a row reduction question. Awesome. Um, you may be required to do row reduction, so uh, prepare yourself. It is also a 25 minute test, so you'll have time to do some, some arithmetic here. Um, find the solution to this system of linear equations. Now, before you embark on your row reduction adventure, figure out what the end of the story has to be. Here you're actually required to extract the solutions, which means you need to go, you, you need to actually perhaps go to reduced row echelon form or use back substitution to say what the solutions are. Many questions will only require you to go to row echelon form and just state the number of solutions or whether or not the system has solutions, like in the first question we saw. So 
Here I have to go all the way and actually extract the solutions. I prefer reduced to echelon form, so I will do reduced to echelon form. You may prefer back substitution. Uh, you are wrong to prefer back substitution. <laughs> always, always reduce to echelon form. Um, so system of equations, throw it in an advanced matrix. That's, that's what you should do. can only do one row operation at a time. So I'll do three. Negative one? Negative. Where? The one before that, the third entry in that row. Third entry in this. Do you mean this one? Sorry to. No, no, tell no, me. Tell me. That should be negative one. Five plus minus four. Positive one. Sorry, I'm confused. Okay, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. That's cool. Thank you for keeping me honest. I'd rather you tell me now than, you know, in, in three matrices time when, uh, oh, what's going on? Yeah, it's still. Um, no, I'm pretty confident attention. this is going to work out. No, it's, it's all right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so at this point, at this point, we know there are solutions, which is good, and we kind of knew by the wording of the question there were going to be solutions. So. Cool. So far, so good. We're on. We're on the right track. This is row echelon form, by the way, um, but we need to go beyond row echelon form. Uh, it's going to get nasty at this point because I need to. Well, I need to get. I, w I want to go to reduced row echelon form, which means I need to make uh, this disappear, and I only have a two, so I'm going to multiply this row one by two. Now I can do row. Okay, pretty nasty. Um, I can clean this up into a reduced rational form. All I need to do is just make that a one and make that a one. So I'll divide row one by two and row two. Just to just to make this in this one. And maybe I'll maybe I'll do that up here so I have my um because I'll need some, a little bit more space. So after all my row operations, I get this. Okay, maybe I'll just pause to appreciate reduced row echelon form. These are my leading terms. They're the only non-zero terms in the uh, in each leading column. 
and I've got this row of zeros on the bottom. So it's, it's row echelon form, but better, because, well, why, why might you say it's better? Well, let me, let me tell you. Because when I actually go to extract the solutions out of this, I don't have to do any more arithmetic. The augmented matrix is really useful for arithmetic. So I do all my arithmetic in the augmented matrix, and only at the very last moment do I extract things out of the matrix. Only when I'm not going to do any more arithmetic do I actually extract things. So, how do we extract things? These are the non-leading columns corresponding to variables x3 and x4. The fact that they're non-leading means you can choose them. They're effectively parameters. So we name them parameters. I'm going to let x3 be equal to lambda 1 and x4 be equal to lambda 2. These being traditional names for parameters. From my super row echelon form, I can, I can say what x2 is in terms of my parameters x1 and x2. From row 2, I know that x2 is equal to 2. Uh, maybe I should just write it out first. From row 2, I know x2 plus 1 half. And from row 1, what does row 1 tell me? Good, and now I can use this to say what x2 is. x2 is just 2 minus half lambda 1 plus half lambda 2, and similarly for x1. Well, x1, uh, x1 is minus 4 plus 7 halves lambda 1 minus 11 halves lambda 2. x2, I can get it out of here. This is 2 minus 1 half lambda 1 plus 1 half lambda 2. x3 is lambda 1, x2, x4 is lambda 2, which I'll write which I'll write as the constant vector plus lambda 1 times the coefficients of lambda 1, so that's 7 over 2, negative 1 half, 1, 0, plus lambda 2 times the coefficients of lambda 2, negative 11 halves, 1 half, 0, 1. Oh. Wow. Um, that's a lot of work. Something you should do at this stage is just substitute something back in just to make sure that you've got a reason you've got a reasonable uh, some, some, that you're reasonable. So let's take the point negative four two zero zero. That's pretty easy to sub in. I could sub it in here. I get negative four plus plus six is equal to two. Okay, uh, uh, that's so far so good. Here that's positive four positive eight minus eight is zero. Uh, Positive four plus two is six. Uh, yeah, okay, this is this is good. Whatever has happened, at least this bit is correct. At least this is a point on the plane. So I'll be, I'll be guaranteed at least one. I don't particularly want to bother checking this stuff here. Um, comments? Yeah, I mean, you you always just, uh, your attitude is awesome. You, you always think about how to check your solution. So that's definitely something I think we can recommend to everyone is whenever you've computed something, think about a way of checking it. Well, it's high stakes. This is probably... You know, most of them, this would be a four mark question, and you want to make sure that you know, it's so easy to make mistakes here. Uh, you don't want to throw it away just because you made some trivial error. Yeah. Although, I mean, the way you just, uh, I mean, you pointed it out that you're only checking this part here, yeah. you're not checking the other components. So, you know, if you have extra time, maybe actually plug check the in, other stuff you know, too. Yeah. Check, check other stuff, yeah. If you've got time. But I'm, yeah, look, I'm happy so far. Yeah. No, but it's, it's good. It's, well, I have no okay. suggestions, I think. Um, what about, what are your feelings on reduced row echelon form or back substitution? Do you... Question of taste. I, I like, I'm with you. I like a reduced row echelon form because, as you say, you know, you do all your arithmetic in there and I think it makes you write less in total. Yeah, and this one's nasty. I mean, negative 7 on 2, 11 on 2. First time I saw that, I thought, I, I've done something wrong. This is <laughs> 7? No, the answer can't have a 7 in it. Um, yeah, uh, you're less, I think you're less likely to to get tripped up if you keep it in the matrix. Yep. Um, there was a question on the on the live um, the chat, chat um, which asked, does it matter which 
which components you set equal to your lambdas? Maybe you can you can answer that. No, no, it doesn't. Well, well it doesn't. Well, except it's well, got to be well, the. The non-leading columns, Yes, right? of course, it has to be the non-leading, so it doesn't. Yes, don't set x1. Um, yeah, the safe bet is to take the things, the, the variables corresponding to non-leading columns. So when we set up the matrix, remember, the first column was the x1, second was x2, third x3, fourth x4, and when you, when you, these, when, when they're non-leading columns, that means you can, you can choose the variables, uh, x3 and x4 to be parameters. I mean, theoretically, you could probably choose, uh, you could probably make this work with x1 as a, you could probably make it work with x1 as lambda, but I'm pretty sure that's not the intention of the question. Yeah. Like, uh, once, once you're here, once you've got a matrix that looks like this, you, you want it to be the non-leading. Yeah, just columns. choose the non-leading ones. I'm overcomplicating this. Non-leading ones, they become the yeah. parameters. There you go. All right, next yeah. question. That's it. And you've also got some fans um, oh. with, for you, your Babylonian mathematics. I do? Um, All right. Yeah, you should go and read the comments. I'll go have a read of the um, comments now. Yeah. I'll th I want this off. And there's someone asking us to do a specific question, and oh, I haven't. Right. I don't think we've got the note. I'll go out. Maybe, I'll maybe go and go get the and notes. grab the notes so yeah, we yeah. can look up what question that actually is. Yeah. We might actually. We might be doing it. I don't know. We might be doing it anyway. It depends right. on. Let's go find out. But I couldn't look it up because I couldn't find it. Right. I'll go find. I'll go grab the notes. Okay. So while Daniel grabs the notes, I'm going to keep going with this question here. That's a question which is from the chapter four problem, but not actually from the sample tests. Ah, oh, Daniel's back already. I've got the notes. Okay, you can you can look up that question. Okay, so I'm I'm going to talk about this question, which is from the chapter four problems, the tutorial problems, not from the sample tests. Um, I'm sure you can go and find it there. It asks um, us to show that this line here is parallel to that plane there. So. Um, yeah, so we've got, about, we've got to think about when, when things are parallel, in particular when, this, when a line is parallel to the plane. Um, and that's, so what we, what we have to do is we have to look at the direction vectors of these two things. So when, you, when you're thinking about how things sit in space and how, whether they're parallel, it doesn't really matter, that the position vector doesn't really matter, you know, the one that gives us a point on the thing, on the line or on the plane. It's the direction vectors that we've got to think about. So the first thing that we should do maybe is we should... Um, figure out what's, what the direction vector of this line is, and we can just read that off the denominator, so it's 2, 3, negative 1. So, maybe I'll just write that down. So the direction vector of the line is just the things in the denominator, 2, 3, and negative 1. Okay, so now that we've got that, when is the, the line parallel to the plane? Well, it's the case when the direction vector of the line is in the span of the direction vectors of the plane. So let me write that down. So the line is parallel to the plane when that direction vector is in the span of the direction vectors of the plane. That's 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1, negative 1. And this is very similar to the first question I discussed um, just earlier. Um, namely, how do you figure out whether something is in the span of something else? Well, you, have to, you solve the linear system and you, try, you, you check if it, has a, if it has a solution. So maybe I'll skip writing down that middle step and I'll go straight to the system. So I'll, I'll, I'll go straight to writing an augmented matrix. So we want to uh, figure out whether this vector here is equal to lambda times that vector plus mu times that vector. So this is going to be my left hand side, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1, negative 1. And on the right hand side, we'll have 2, 3, and negative 1. And now I want to check whether this system has a solution. So let's go and solve it. So let's do some, um, some row operations. So first, let's produce a zero here. So let's do row two minus row one. Okay. And now um, let's add these. Let's add the last two rows. So row three is going to be row three plus row two. We 
get a zero row on the bottom. And um, now we've, well, we, our goal was to produce a, a row echelon form, but we've actually ended up with a reduced row echelon form just because it's such a nice system. So already we've got an ident identity matrix right there and we can read off the solution directly. But in particular, what's important here is we can see that this system has a solution. And if we get a solution, that means that that vector is in this span and that means it is parallel. And that's what we were supposed to show. So let me write that down. This system has a solution. Um, this implies that 2, 3, negative 1 is in the span. And this implies they are parallel. Awesome. Um, cool. This is this is nice. Uh, I like I like that you stop here. I mean, this is row echelon form. You don't need to go further. You don't need to bother saying what the the individual parameters were. It's yeah. It's it, it's nice. Um, cool. I I I, I, was, I think I was outside when you kind of motivated the parallel stuff. Did can you just remind me how that goes? Oh no! You just did. You just take the. I took the, the direction, direction vector uh, of the line, and I said, "Well, we're not worried when it's yeah. just about things being parallel. We're not yeah. worried about the position vectors." But maybe so. One thing is here: this problem you don't get confused because this this is actually a plane that goes through the origin. Mm. And it doesn't have one of these position vectors. Yeah. So maybe yeah, um, maybe can we I talk about that? Okay, okay, okay. What would uh, happen? We need something um, flat. Because um, I think that's something that can. That get, can get confusing sometimes. Yeah, we'll do it together. You can be the plane. So here, I can this, be is, the plane. this is flat. You be the plane, and I'll be the line. So generally, what happens? Say you could have a plane which is anywhere in space, and you have a line which is anywhere in space. And the idea is, you you don't care where they are in space. You don't care, and what you really care about is just the direction. So what you end up doing is you end up taking the line and making it go through the origin, and taking the plane and making it go through the origin. So that way, it's clear you don't that you're only concerned about the directions. And then at that point it becomes a question about is this line actually in the plane? If it's in the plane, then the, the original objects were parallel. If it's not in the plane, then it's like sticking out of the plane like this and then the, uh, the original objects were not parallel. So you end up just ignoring, thank you, whatever, whatever point this line went through and whatever point the plane went through, just center them all at the origin and, and, uh, and take your problem from there. Yeah. Um, so we, can we think of a quick way of checking, of checking that? Well, I mean, here it's, it says show that, so show I that guess here parallel. we already know. If the question was check if, I mean, it's pretty easy to check just because you, I mean, you already have reduced racial on form, so you know that uh, one of these, sorry, one of these and two of these should end up being your direction, and we could just we could just do that. So there's two, three minus one, two three minus one. Yep. There, so yeah. sure you can check that. Okay. All right, next question. Can we do that one last? Okay. Um, the person, the person who asked the question, uh, is happy. Asked a question we hadn't planned to do, but it's actually almost identical to this question. So we'll just do that. Oh, okay. All right. I'll just make myself yep. a little Oh, oh, stuck. I stuck. Okay, no, never mind. Let's just leave. No, no, no. It'll, it'll, people will get frustrated by this. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to make you know, a thousand people angry. So how about that? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so that means I'm up again, does it? Yes. Okay, cool. So now um, here's a question about square roots of complex numbers. So find the complex square roots of 16 minus 30i. Um, and it actually gives us a, a little hint on how to do this. It says by solving that system there. So that's exactly what we're going to do. 
we want to find the, uh, the square root of 16 minus 30 i. 16 minus 30 i. And so this, this is supposed to be the square of some complex number. So we're just writing out that complex number as x plus i y, where x and y are now real numbers. Square. And so if we compute that, we get x squared minus y squared plus 2xyi. And so by comparing the real part and the imaginary part of this number here and that number there, so then we get that 16 is the real part has to be equal to x squared minus y squared and negative 30, which is the, the imaginary part, has to be equal to 2xy. So far, so good. So here we've done nothing other than just rewritten that equation <coughs> and read off the real and the imagine, imaginary part. And I guess this one we can also write it as negative 15 is equal to xy. Okay, now you've got these two equations. You could go straight and solve them in x and y and you'd get some ugly quartic equation. Um, so there's a little trick that you can use that I've, we, we've seen that, that we use in the notes and also uh, hopefully in your tutorial problems. Um, how to produce another equation that will help us solve this system a lot more easily. So um, this relies on the observation that um, x squared plus y squared is equal to, well this is just the, the absolute value of the complex number squared, and this is just um, the absolute value of the number squared. And now we know what this number squared is, namely it's 16 minus 30i. So this is um, the absolute value of 16 minus 30i, which is the square root of 16 squared plus 30 squared. And so now we've got to compute this. So square root of 16 squared is 2 to the 8, that's 256. And 30 squared is 900. So I guess the square root of 1156 is 34. Okay, so by, by, by just working with the absolute value of this um, complex number, we've produced another equation, x squared plus y squared is equal to 34. And we're going to use that equation together with this first equation here in order to solve our system quite easily. So now we've got, okay, let me, let me keep going like that. So we've got x squared minus y squared is equal to 16, and x squared plus y squared is equal to 34. <coughs> so I guess we could go and add these two equations. We get 2x squared is equal to 50, and that means x is equal to plus or minus 5. And now we go back and we use this equation that we haven't used yet. And so if xy is equal to negative 15, then that means, maybe let me write it down. So now xy is equal to negative 15, and knowing that x is plus or minus 5 implies that y has to be equal to negative or plus 3. I'm going to write it like that. So by that I just mean um, x and y have to have opposite signs. And so now I can now I've found the xy of my square root of 16 minus 30i, and I can write it down. So therefore, square root of 16 minus 30i. So maybe I should say the square roots of 16 minus 30i are well, it's 5 minus 3i and negative 5 plus 3i. So I've picked the two where the real part and the imaginary part have opposite signs. Um, yeah, that's it. And again, if you wanted to go and check this solution, well, you, you just have to square one of these things and see that you get mm. you get yeah. what you started I mean, with. It's, it's, so. it's, e it's easy to kind of check these because you could just say, well, even just using these relations is probably the easiest thing to do because you could just take your five your five squared minus your 3 squared, and, and of course that's 16. And five, 2 times 5 times negative 3 is going to be negative 30. So it's, it's yeah, square it or just use these relations. Um, 
I do these ones a slightly different way, so maybe I can I can have a turn just showing sure. a, a slightly different way of doing it. It's always good. I to don't know, know, if know it, more than one one way to solve something. I don't know if it's going to work out though, because I didn't. I, I I'm in uncharted territory, so I'll leave this bit. What if you didn't have a calculator to do that? You don't have a calculator. That's yeah. You, so <laughs> I'd be slightly worried about this. Uh, the square root of eleven fifty six. Yes. Um, I'll leave the answer so I make sure I land in the right place. <laughs> All right. But yeah, I don't know if this is going to work out, so I'm... No, I'm not, no, you've made me really curious. I'm nervous. What you can do. <laughs> right. um, um, so I'm going to take these two equations, and I'm going to make it in a quadratic equation, but a quadratic equation in x squared. So from this one, I know that 16... Oh, I'm still wet. Oh, I know what you're going to do. Yeah, that'll work. I did it before. I tried it out. I like the other way better, but well, it'll work. Well, it's just computing the square, the, the square root of, what, 34 squared. I'd You'll still have to do that, though. Will I? Let's find out. Let, let's, let's check. So I'm going to say y is equal to negative x on 15. Okay, so just, just rearranging this one. And then I can substitute that in there. I get 16 is equal to x squared minus negative x on 15 squared. And I can take the 15 squared up there. 16 times 15 squared. No, other way, other way around. Sorry. It's going to be negative 15 on x. See, it's already gone bad for yeah. me. That looks better. Okay. Okay. Let's try that again. <laughs> Let's try that again. So negative 15 on x squared. And I'll take the x squared up, and I get. Uh, 0 is equal to x to the 4. Maybe I'll write that as x squared squared minus 16 x squared uh, minus 15 squared. So just, just taking the x squared up to the numerator and rearranging things, I get this quadratic equation. Um, I probably still have to figure out what 15 squared is. Should be trouble. You're going to have to multiply it by 4. And I'm going to have to multiply it by 4. And, and you're going to have to take the square root of 11. Ah, ah, no, this is not what I wanted at all. So, by the quadratic formula uh, 16 plus or minus the square root of b squared. Yeah, I, it's, argu it's arguable this is not, in fact, any easier than what you did. Um, yeah. Well, maybe it's not easier, but it's certainly an, an alternative, and it's an alternative way method. to do it. So uh, maybe I, could take, I think it doesn't hurt. I could take the 4 out of here. Actually, maybe this will end up being easier, because I can take the 4 out of here uh, and take oh, a 2 out of clever. here. So this will be 2 square root of 8 squared, which is humanly possible. No, you want to take a 4 out of the 16 as well. Do I, I want to take... Oh, it's a 16 squared. 16 squared. Okay, no, you're fine. Am I, is this okay? I think so. I don't know. Uh, yeah, and this should be, this should be positive. Okay. But it's negative 15, so that is actually minus 15 squared, so that becomes positive. Um, yeah, look, I don't think this is actually any easier than, um, than what you had. AC, so minus 4, four AC, yeah, it's negative 15, 15 which makes it positive, okay. yeah. uh, divided by 2, so 8 plus or minus, I see, I have to do this now and, and figure out what that is, 64 plus 225, uh, 64 plus 225, Yeah, you see, I, I, I don't know how to take that square root. I don't know. Yeah, at this point, how would they do that? 
you need you, surely you need a calculator to do this question. That's a sort of smaller square. Some people have these these squares memorized. I don't. Yeah, I, I mean we to, could we I could probably know. figure this out. I mean, seventeen? Is it seventeen squared? <coughs> I don't know. So yeah, it has to be. It has to be squared. seventeen squared. It was two fifty six. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. Uh. Gives you no, the right no. final answer too. And it's, I've done something stupid here. That's not right. Seven times one. Yeah. Yeah, it is seventeen squared. Ha 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 ha! I can do this after all. <laughs> Plus or minus seventeen. All right, all right, all right. It is possible to do your class test. There we go. Um, eight plus so. X squared is equal to 8 plus or minus 17, which means, okay, okay. So let me, let me abbreviate that now. I know X squared is 8 plus or minus 17 after some laborious calculation. Which means it's either equal to 8 plus 17, which is 25, or it's equal to 8 minus 17, which is minus 9. And now we have to use the fact that we know x is real. And a real number squared cannot be equal to a negative number, so we cross off the negative 9. And so uh, since x is an element of the real numbers, then x squared cannot be equal to negative 9. x squared is 25, so x is plus or minus 5. And once you have x is plus or minus 5, you can figure out that y is minus or plus 3. Two methods. And two I, now. There's two things I like better about this solution, and one is that you don't have to remember that trick with the absolute value. So this is something you know. If I haven't done this in three months, I have to go look it up every time. Um, and the other thing is that the square root you were taking was actually much smaller um, than the one I had to take. So maybe there is actually some merit in doing this, doing it this way. Yeah. Okay, but Thanks now, you, now, you, now you are armed with all the methods that we know of <laughs> actually solving this problem. Look, there'll be cases where your method is just downright faster. And I hope that none of you get uh, a square root as, as ugly as we have. Like that, I, I, yeah. It, it, yeah. I wouldn't expect people to know what the square root of 17 squared is. Right, and certainly not 1156. That's only because I've prepared for this and I did the problem before. And of course I pulled out my calculators below. That's what a reasonable which person would do. Is a bit cheating because on the test you don't have one. Well, we got, we got there. We got there in the end. Um, good, and this is the question. This is very similar to the question that was asked in the forum. Right. So that makes it my turn again, does it? Yes. Okay. This is like I see another linear system coming. Okay. So here's a question. The the middle question on this sheet. I'm um, determine whether these two lines intersect. Um, so, well, this is something that I think most people would have done in school. Um, you want to find out whether there's a common, a common point on these lines or sort of a common, yeah, a, a common x to these two lines. So we set, we set the two things equal and we see if there's a solution. Um, so let's, let's do that. So let's set them equal. Negative 1, 3, 0, plus lambda. Two, one, four. Question is, oh, it's still, still wet. wet. Maybe that window thingy is actually useful. The Windex thing, we can use it. Uh, I, meant, I, I actually, I meant this thing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That, sorry, that's what I meant too. Uh, I thought this was the Windex. That is, anyway. yeah, sorry. Okay, let me keep going. So let's, let's set these two things equal. One, two, two plus lambda 2, 2, 5. Okay, now here we see something which could happen. We've got two lambdas, but they're actually not the same lambda. So that's something you've got to be careful about. There's a lambda here, which is sort of contained to 
the, the equation for this line, and there's a lambda there, which is sort of contained to the equation for that line, but they're not the same lambda. They're at different parameters lambda. So when I want to set these things equal, just to make, to make it very clear that these are not the same lambdas, I'm just going to call that lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay. So now we want to go and see whether there's a so we want to find the solution to this. We want to see whether there's a solution. So let's let's rewrite this as I'm just gonna do it slowly so I don't stuff it up. Lambda two, bring this to the other side. Is equal to, and now I've got one, two, two minus this one, so this is two, negative one, two. Okay. So now I want to find it what want to check whether there's a solution to this. So let me write the augmented matrix and do some row reduction. First, let's take two row two minus row one. So that's going to be negative four minus negative two is minus two. Negative four. And here, let's take. So again, I'm, I'm I'm doing what we said before that we prefer not to do, which is several steps in one sort of in, in one go. But just because my space is a bit limited here. Let me, let me do that again. So here I'm going to take row 3 minus 2 row 1. And I'm going to get... Okay. And one more step. Um, add twice the last line to the second line. So row three is going to be two, row three plus row two. And that just produces a bunch of zeros in the last row. So now we said we wanted to um, find out whether this system had a solution. And at this point we can say, well, we've produced a row echelon form. And at this point we can say that it has a solution. So this system has a solution. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the lines do intersect. So this means um, and that answers the question. Yeah. Cool. No, it's, it's perfect. Um, I'm impressed by your row reduction skills. Um, yeah, cool. It's, and, and look, this is this is exactly what you would expect to do. I mean, you ask to intersect two objects, you just set them to be equal and, and see what happens. So this is perfectly, this is a very natural thing that you might do, have done even in high school. Um, row reduction, right conclusion. So yeah, we, have, we don't need to go any further than row echelon form to state how many solutions there are. The question doesn't require it. You, if you were required to determine where the point of intersection was, then you wouldn't you would need to figure out what one of these lambda was, lambdas were. So he had lambda 2. You could, you could just pick out from this row alone that lambda 2 was negative 2 and, and figure it out that way. Yeah. And again, if you have extra time, that's a good way of checking your solution because then you can go and you can actually check yeah. that you find this intersection point. It's not required here, but if you have time and you want to sec uh, check your solution, yeah, then you can just. That's what I would suggest. Exactly you can check that the lambda. Yeah, you can check that you have the point of intersection. Nice. All right, okay. my turn. Complex roots coming up. It's not so bad. I didn't say it was bad. It's true though, I don't like that sort of question. Uh, cool. But that's okay, because I do. Uh, <laughs> that's why I get this question. Thank you. So, um, here we have the question of finding the complex roots of some, the, the nth roots of some complex number. Um, and there's a process here that you can go through to find the complex roots. 
And a typical part B to this is once you have the roots, then factorize it into its real factors and its real irreducible, sorry, it's complex, 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 onto real linear and real irreducible quadratic factors. Sometimes you get asked to factorize it into complex linear factors. That's always a kind of intermediate step here. You need the complex linear factors in order to get the real quadratic the factors. Right, so what is, the, what is the procedure for part one? Solve. Sorry, is it still wet? Yeah. Ah. So we want to solve z to the five. Supposing we have a solution. The trick here is to make everything in terms of polar form. You're dealing with powers of complex numbers. Always use polar form. So. So suppose you have some z, suppose z is in its polar form, and then, well, z to the 5 is equal to 32. This is not a surprise, z to the 5 minus 32 is equal to 0, so you have it like this, but then you write everything in polar form. This is 2 to the power of 5, being 32, times uh, e to the 2 pi k i. This is the polar form of 32. 32 times 1, essentially, but we're getting all its non-principal arguments here. You need these non-principal arguments. You're supposed to get five solutions, and this is where you get the kind of multiplicity, uh, k. k is just some integer here. And on the other hand, this is r e to the i theta to the power of 5, which, by de Marge's theorem, is r to the 5 e to the i 5 theta. And then you have two forms of the same complex number. Here is r5 e to the i5 theta, and here is 2 to the 5 e to the 2 pi k i. And you can equate the modulus of these things, and you can equate the argument of these things. Equating the modulus tells you that r to the 5 is equal to 2 to the 5. So r is just 2. r is not hard to find. It's just 2. Uh, and it also tells you, equating the arguments here, tells you that 5 theta is equal to 2 pi k i. No, no not with the i's. 2 pi k. 2 pi k. Or, in other words, theta is equal to 2 pi k on 5. OK, now we just need to start extracting some values of theta. So here we have some. Uh, k's, let's make a table, k and theta. I like to pick k values of k centered around uh, zero. Choose the, choose the smallest possible values of k, including the negative ones. So we need five of them. I'll pick zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two. So this is, when k is negative two, this is minus 4 pi on 5. k is minus 1. That's and here are all my values of k. At this point, I might, uh, might draw things. So, So here's a circle of radius 2, 
this is my real part, this is my imaginary axis, and I've got the five roots. I've got one here at the point uh, when theta is equal to zero, so here's one of the roots, uh, which is, well, they all have the shape r e to the i theta, and in this case r is two, and e to the i theta is e to the zero i. Uh, plus or minus two, five, two fifths of pi, so that's there, two fifths. There, there, four fifths, say, there and there. So, uh, when theta is equal to negative four fifths, that's this one over here. Uh, e to the negative two pi on five i. E to the zero. E to the two pi on five pi and e to the 4 pi on 5 pi. I think, it, I think it helps to draw a picture, just to cement in your mind what's going on here. Um, with twos. Two, 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 two. See, and the only reason I remember to include, remember to include the twos is this is a circle of radius two, so it's a, it's a helpful object. Um, so here we have the complex roots. Notice that all of them are different by uh, 2 pi on 5. And in fact, whenever you have um, roots, uh, kind of roots of unity question, this angle between your roots is always going to be this number divided by no, 2 pi divided by this number. There, it doesn't matter what this junk is, the roots are always going to be different by a rotation of 2 pi on this number. So these are all different by 2 pi on 5. Right, so I might just get rid of the rest of that stuff and go to part B. Um, in fact, so we've done part A, here are the roots. In fact, i just extend that a bit. I, uh, factorize this into real linear and qu linear and real irreducible quadratic factors. So, z to the 5 minus 32 is equal to, now you just churn out the roots. This is the, uh, the polynomial expressed in terms of linear complex terms, I should say. So z minus, uh, let's do this one, e to the 2 e to the z minus 2 e to the positive And I'll do these two, that's 2 e to the 2 pi on 5 pi, z minus e to the negative 2 pi on 5 pi, and the linear term is z minus 1, this one. And notice I've written them 2, 2, z minus 2. The circle just comes back again and again. These two, okay, so notice I've written them in the complex conjugate pairs next to each other. And the reason I've done that is because now I can multiply these two things together and I actually end up with a real quadratic. This one I'll write as z squared and this I can write as minus 2z, so it's this times this, e to the 4 pi i the 5 plus e to the negative 4 plus this times this, which is just 4, times by the next one. I think I'll move, I'll move this up here. The next one, can they, can they see that? Yeah, okay. Thank you. z squared plus two, minus 2z. Two plus e to the negative 2 pi on 5, plus again this, this times this is just 4, and z minus 2. And maybe I'll modify this a little bit, you can see where I'm going, that's going to become a 4, and that one can become a 4, and now this is just cos.
Huh. Right. I'm done. Yep. Uh, well done. It's it's good. Um, lots of explanation. I mean, we can see that you've got your um, roots, your complex roots down. Um, that picture wouldn't be required no, for the no, for the solution no. of a test question, would no. it? It would certainly not. In fact, you could, you could probably just write for the end of part A, you could write z is equal to 2 e to the plus or minus 4 pi 1 5 pi 2 e. Yeah, that's probably what That's the most think. compacted write, way of writing, uh, writing. Don't even attempt to get it in Cartesian form. Just leave it like this. Yeah, yeah but uh, and in general, I guess, whenever you ask to, often when you're asked to find factors, it's actually the way to go is actually to go and find roots. Yeah, and that's you do it. want you do want the complex conjugate pairs together anyway. Yeah, and certainly. So, do you want to talk about the fact that it's not a coincidence we ended up with complex conjugate pairs? Um. No, uh, it's, it's, it's because it's a co polynomial with real coefficients. So whenever you have something like this, you there's a theorem that says you will always end up with your roots occurring in pairs. So it's not a not a kind of coincidence that the roots here are pairs, here are pairs. This is a pair with itself. It's they it always happens, and every time you see a real polynomial, you will get this kind of phenomenon occurring. So it's and kind of an easy question for us to ask because we know the answer will end up being something like this. And in order to get your real quadratic factors, then you have to multiply the linear yeah. factors together that have the the corresponding yeah. Um, complex conjugates. Yeah. Um, yeah, they wouldn't be expected to simplify that. No, I wouldn't bother today. simplifying it. I, I no, wouldn't know. I wouldn't know, I wouldn't what know that off is. the top of my head. I would ask Sage to do it for me or, you know, maple. I, or I wouldn't, yeah, I don't okay. think that's required. Yeah, it's, no, it's beautiful. It's, it's quadratic and real. I, that's, that's enough. All right, one more question. Good. We could just get all the water off it, like, yeah. like that. Except you've lost your. I've lost the market. All right, I'll have to wing it. I think that that will be fine. Um, I could just leave the filth here, and <laughs> <laughs> then I'll know. Nobody can see it. <laughs> question. It said, would we need to put in quadratic form? I'm not quite... Quadratic form? Do you... Uh, I'm, can I'm you, not sure. Can you imagine what they mean? Uh, can, you, can you expand on what you mean by quadratic form? I did write it as a product of quadratic, uh, real quadratic polynomials. Um, that is what the question asked us to do, so I'm not sure what the... Comment, uh, clarify please in the comments. I'll get on with this. So this is a typical tutorial problem. Look, the, the purpose of this question is really just practice with uh, getting things into rho echelon form and understanding what that means. So for which values of lambda does does this thing have either no solutions, infinitely, infinitely many solutions, or a unique solution? So let's, uh, let's do this. It's a system of equations. It should just be muscle memory to you now. What do you do with a system of equations? Our linear equations, you get them in an augmented matrix and you get to row echelon form. Every question requires you to do this. So if you do get a question which involves linear equations, and you don't know what the question's asking you, just get into row echelon form. That, that's, that's half of the question, guaranteed. So now I have to eliminate things, and there's a lambda here, so I need to actually do something fancy here. Well, my row operation will require me to take away something which is a multiple of lambda. just negate uh, this, this row as well.
and I can get rid of this term, whatever it be. And I might write this one more time with that thing factorized. So, in fact, I might write it up here. So this is lambda minus 2, lambda minus 1. Okay, now I don't need this. Good. And the question now becomes, is it in rho echelon form? And the answer is, well, well, maybe. This is definitely a leading term. This, this might be a leading term. We don't know. We don't know yet. And this might also be a leading term. We don't know. This could also be a leading term. We don't know. It depends on it depends on lambda. So these things, well, it's clear this is a leading term. These ones require us to consider the matrix on a case by case basis. First case we'll consider is what happens if lambda is negative two. We'll consider that case and then we'll start treating this as a leading term. So if lambda is equal to minus two, then we get. So this becomes uh, minus three. That's minus four times minus three, which is twelve. And this is minus three. And it's not row echelon form, so I have to make it row echelon form. And now we've got, a, a, these are leading terms, here's, an, here's your no solution style matrix. It's, this last row here is telling you that 0 is equal to 1. 0 is not 1, no solutions. You can, and you can just say no solutions. Alright, so having considered the case where lambda is equal to negative 2, we will now treat this as a leading term. And we'll consider what happens for other values of lambda. What happens if lambda is equal to minus 2? Sorry, lambda is equal to 2. Well, then what do we get? From this matrix, we get 2, 2, uh, 0, 4. And again, this is a no solutions matrix. Leading term, leading term. Oh, no, this is a leading. This, this constant column is leading. Again, it tells you 0 is equal to 1. No solutions. All right. Now we'll say, well, 0 is not... Minus 2 is not 2. Let's consider the case where lambda is equal to negative 1. Sorry, lambda is equal to positive 1. What do we get? And here we have a, this is no longer, this is a, no longer a leading column. And we have infinitely many solutions. And you can quickly just remember that you have, you, you, this is a non-leading column corresponding to uh, Z, so you can choose Z effectively as a parameter. So, infinitely. And finally, if lambda is not negative, uh, is not uh, two or one, then this is a leading term. And so we've considered all the cases we need to consider. If lambda is not 
is neither plus or minus 2 or 1, then this is a leading these are all leading terms and there are unique solutions. Lambda is not equal to plus or minus 2 or 1 unique solutions. And just to summarize here, no solutions plus or minus 2, infinitely many solutions 1, unique solutions otherwise. Huh. That's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, the quadratic nature, the quadratic bit here is um, tricky. It is tricky. But I wanted to cover it because, you know, you get, I don't want the first time you see a, a row reduction with a lambda in it um, to be in your test, so yeah. it's important to cover. Yeah, no, but that was, that was well done. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, the thing is, treat the lambda like a number. I mean, just don't let it confuse you. I mm. think that's the, that's the main piece of advice I have yeah, for, yeah. Still going for a question to, like this. Still going to row echelon form, even though, even though it's got lambdas in it. That's, yeah, don't let it confuse you. Cool. All right. Well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if we want okay. to still. So one question is, why did you, so in the question two, you wrote down you did something by de Moivre's theorem. Yes. And I think the question is, where was that used exactly? That was when you pulled in the, uh, the That was in the cos theta is equal to half yeah, e theta. Yeah, it, it was like cos yeah. i theta to the fourth is equal to cos four yeah, i yeah. theta, so I think. So maybe you could just say that again. we expanded something of the form e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta is equal to five. And that involves you taking the fifth power of this plus five times the fourth power of this times the first power of this plus ten times the third power of this plus the second power of this and so on. You have to do something with all these, uh, these powers. And the thing you do in the first example, say, is e to the... So this is equal to e to the i theta to the power five plus other junk. And the thing you want to do is take the five inside here. 5 theta. And the thing that lets you do that is de Moivre's theorem. I mean, the, the, Euler's, the, the, the Euler notation here is kind of misleading. This is just a notation. And yes, it's such a great notation. It's written like it's an exponent because it obeys the index laws. And so you might say, oh, this is just a number. I can just use the index laws. Well, no, no. This is an abbreviation for something else. But it's a really suggestive abbreviation, suggesting to you that you can just apply the index laws. Which you can. It's just that's called de Moivre's theorem. So that's, that's what's going on. And if you don't remember that, then just apply it like it, the index laws work. Because actually, they do. Uh, yeah, other questions? Thanks for clarifying is there that. Anything else? Um, I think there's two more questions. I don't know if we have more time or if we should just answer them in the chat. They, so the last, asking, one, the the last one here is how to solve a quadratic with complex coefficients. Uh, which is no, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm too done. Well, that, that too one we can just it. say in words. I mean, you yeah, use the quadratic formula and you, yeah. you, you do it the way you've always done it, except now you have to compute with, with complex numbers. So yeah. I, think, that's, I think that's it. Yeah, that's the solution. Yeah, just quadratic formula. And that's something you should know how to do, compute yeah. with complex numbers. Yeah. So that's the other question yeah. I think that shows up. You know the first question in the, in the test that we chose to, li to leave yeah. out where you just have to sort of invert some complex numbers or yeah. something? Can I, can I just add to what you, yeah. what you said? So when you do apply the quadratic formula, it will require you to take a square root of a complex number, which is something we've already done. Yeah. So we, we've kind of already covered that. The, the meaty bit is taking a square root of a complex number, and, and that yeah, we, you've already seen how to do that. Yeah. Um, and there was another question? Well, the, the, the other question, I think, is the, the, the first sort of not-so-hard questions of the, of the test where they, compute, they, they ask you to compute with complex numbers, like, I don't know, find the inverse, find the complex conjugate, whatever, whether we could do one of those. I don't know if we have time to do that. Or uh, let's let's um, let's do one. Yeah. So it asks for. I hope I hope I've read this correctly. So it says something like, question one, test one, the second example. So here's test one, question one, okay. the second example. I don't know if you'd be able to okay. just yeah, yeah, do sure. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'll do that. So hopefully this is a. Hopefully this is what you're after. Um, so if z is find uh, z over w conjugate, this, I hope this is what you, what you mean. Um, 
Well, you need to get this in Cartesian form right now. It's 1 plus 5i divided by 1 plus 2i. Remember, the conjugate just negates the imaginary part. And the deal is you need to get the i on the top or, or make the denominator real. And you make the denominator real by multiplying through by the conjugate of whatever is on the bottom, which in this case is just w, because the conjugate of w conjugate is w. And you just expand this out. This is going to be 1 minus 2i plus 5i uh, plus 5 plus negative 10 times i squared, which is positive 10, divided by this thing, which is just 1 plus 4. So 1 plus 10 over 5 plus 3i over 5. I'm starting to run out of energy. This is 11 over 5 plus i 3 fifths. Right, have I made a mistake? It's entirely possible at this stage. No, I don't know, I was looking at the chat, so okay. I, I haven't actually been following uh, what you did, but you probably right. um, Anyway, that's the idea. This is, this, is, this is the idea. This shouldn't be a, uh, a difficult question for you. Um, it's really just going through the motions. Really, really th this first question here where it says do some, do some stuff with complex numbers, this is just going to ensure that you get at least two marks. Uh, you should expect to be doing this 100%. This is, this is, yeah, this is the easy part. The complex, the harder part is uh, doing the row reduction stuff and possibly finding some more more involved complex number questions. Right. I think that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck with your <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good luck.